Top Med Talk. Well, hello and welcome back to Top Med Talk here at Anesthesiology 2023. It's the annual meeting of the American Society of Anesthesiologists. I'm Desiree Chapel, your host, and I'm joined by our guest host, Guy Ledbrook. Hello, Guy. It's great to be here. The sun's out. The fog's rolled away. It's terrific. <laughs> it is absolutely terrific. Guy, it has been a phenomenal three days, and we cannot thank you enough from the bottom of our hearts for filling in that chair and sitting there and having these great conversations with us. Heck, it's completely selfish. <laughs> I've learned an enormous amount over the last two or three days, which has been invaluable. It has. We love to take all this information with us. I have to tell you, it's not completely altruistic that we share it with the world. We're glad to get it for ourselves, for sure. But we did want to give a big shout out to the ASA as well for providing us with this gorgeous booth, this space. We couldn't do it without you. We couldn't be here having these conversations, being able to record those and put them out to the world without your generous support. So thank you so much. And also to our generous sponsors, um, our partners in Top Med Talk, um, Medtronic, GE, Edwards Life Sciences. Without you helping us to keep the lights on, to keep going, we couldn't keep Top Med Talk free and open to the world. So we have people listening in over 100 countries. So wherever you are in the world, thank you so much for listening. We have had over 2,000 podcasts, over 2 million downloads, so couldn't be possible without your support. So thank you so, so much. So we've had some great conversations, like Guy said, over the last weekend, and this one is sure to be as wonderful. We have a returning guest, actually, Ji Wang Wang from Louisville, my hometown, (laughs) at the University of Louisville professor there. Ji Wang, thank you so much for joining us. That's right. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here again. And uh, I really uh, thank you all for putting all the knowledge out there for everybody. So this is wonderful. Thank you so much for all you do. Well, we, I really appreciate that. That means a lot. I know we had been for a long time trying to make this happen. I think we caught up this past year. AUA, Association of University of Anesthesiologists. University of Anesthesiologists. Yeah. That's right. So it all came together in Denver this last year. We had a great conversation yeah. there. You can find that on topmentalk.com. But today, I thought we'd catch up on a topic that we really have not talked about for some time now about brain health, about depth of anesthesia, and really using different types of monitoring to help drive where we're going. I mean, there are a lot of different ways to give anesthesia right now. We're giving anesthesia in a lot of different places inside and outside the OR. I think it's a very appropriate topic, um, you know, that we kind of start bringing up again. Um, So tell us a little bit about you know, where we are with depth of anesthesia monitoring and, and kind of some of the, the different ways that we're doing that now. Okay. So anesthesia is, a, you know, it's a, everybody thinks anesthesia is pretty easy. But when patients come to surgery, right, when I talk to them, I said, you know, are you, are you worried about anything? Do you have any concerns? They already worry about, always worry about anesthesia more than surgery itself. Yeah. They say, I worry about it. I'm not going to wake up. Yeah. And so that's... Uh, that's or, or that I may actually wake up in the middle. Exactly. Something like that, yeah. You're definitely right. And so that's right. And I... So when we talk to those patients, we say, you know what? We can figure it out how deep you are with anesthesia. So it used to be in the old days, we really rely on the vital signs. We look at the heart rate, like the blood pressure. All, you know, what's come to all is if the patient is moving or not. Yeah. If the patient is moving, we think the patient might be awake. And uh, probably at least 20, 30 years ago, so, you know, some smart people came up with the idea and said, why don't we look at the uh, brain activity? So EEG, electroencephalogram. Uh, 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 gram. And so what that is, it really analyze the brain activity and to figure out how deep you are on anesthesia. So we are anesthesia providers and we're a non-neurologist. So for us to look at the 12 leads or 12 channel, 16 channel EEG, I don't understand what that means. <laughs> so, uh, so, so that's why really probably, I, I would say probably 15, 20 years ago, they started using process EEG. So what that means is they take all the electrical activity of the brain together, then they come analyze with a really advanced algorithm down there. And so what they come up with, with one number, uh, so zero to 100, and 100 means you're really, really awake. Zero means you're really, really asleep. And uh, with anesthesia, what we try to get to really the number between about 40 to 60, mm-hmm. that's what we try to do. And there's still some debate regarding should I use process EEG, should I not use process EEG? And, uh, you know, one other thing I would see, though, I, I teach residents all the time and teach students. And uh, I see some of the younger residents, and they say, well, I can figure it out how deep the anesthesia is by just looking at the patient, you know, to, you know, check their mm. heart rate, blood pressure. And I said, uh, this is what I said to them in real words. I said, uh, I've been there for 21 years. Mm. I consider myself, you know, pretty decent. And he said, oh, it is. <laughs> yeah. I can't figure it out. There's no way for me to yeah. know. And uh, 
especially nowadays, there we have so many patients on beta blockers. Uh, yes, absolutely. Right? I would say the complexity yeah. of our patients now. I mean, age, comorbidities, but, the medications that they're on. If we're using multimodal pain management and not, you know, are doing things to manipulate their blood pressure, right? Those crude and you know indicators that we use for a very long time are not. I mean, they're not really. I don't know, guy. What about you? Your thought? Yeah, look, I, I wish I could kind of. Uh, estimate how deeply my right. patient is, but I'm using a population average and our population right. is kind of like getting broader, figuratively and literally actually o- over time. Right. But I think the other thing that we've heard this week is the hypotension and really all the things that go along with that. And I watch people without processed EEG try to adjust blood pressure with the Lee. volatile or whatever anesthetic agent you're using. Yeah. But surely you need to separate that because especially in an older population using uh, concomitant medications, you can be surprised right. how little they need. And if you're fighting hypotension and you think the mechanism's all wrong, it just does seem to be a bit perverse. So I agree right. exactly with what you're saying. Oh, thank you. I fully agree with, with, with your statement too. And I think that... Uh, uh, you know, the other way we actually, you know, check the depth of anesthesia really based on the population study, right? We we'll use MEC, minimal alveolar concentration. Right. This is a really see, you know, the definition of MEC is if I use this concentration, 50% of the people will now move to surgical stimulation. You just don't want to be that 50%. <laughs> you just don't want to be that 50%. So that's why. You want to be that 50% if, if you're paralyzed. Oh, you <laughs> and and uh, especially now, this, like you said, so... We pretty much paralyze the patient. Every, most, most everybody, cases, yeah. Right. We don't want the patient to move. We want to ensure have good surgical conditions. So I think, you know, nowadays, not to monitor the depth of anesthesia is, I told my resident, I said, I mean, this is still practicing anesthesia, but you're practicing anesthesia in the 70s. Mm. Now, if that's what you want to learn, that's fine. But I want to teach you more, more than anesthesia. So how you do it. Yeah. So it's, in my practice, I... Uh, pretty much for all my cases, I use process EG monitoring pretty much all my cases. Yeah. Even for the MEC cases, the monitoring oh, really? cases. Yeah. So kind of give the right level of sedation. For exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, we do a lot of regional cases. We yep. do not uh, do a spinal cases. Yep. And it used to be we just give a little uh, medazinum and uh, to see, hey, you know, you're, you're putting them. You shouldn't worry about anything. But nowadays, nobody want to lay on the table for two hours yep. without any sedation. Yeah. So they don't want to, they don't want to be awake. So in yeah, those patients, uh, I actually put the base monitor on there. I want their base 50, 60, kind of how the heart end. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think the uh, the the next question would be what what are the evidence? Yeah. Are there any evidence to support using the EEG? So I think everybody's tried to quote the study in 2019. They engaged. Engaged. Yeah. Uh, and this study actually showed there's no differences. If you use the EEG, we're seeing not a uh, process EEG, we're still not using that. And, um, uh, and what was that? What was the outcome that they were post up delirium? Yeah, delirium was the, what they were looking at. Right. Yes. They look at the post up delirium, and but if you dig into that study, that study, so you in their control group is you still put the base monitor on there, but you cover the number up, so you don't know. In the intervention group, they actually let the anesthesiologist decide, so it's a non. So you're going to keep the base at a 4 to 60. If you actually dig into that study, many people in the intervention group actually have the base below 40. Mm. So it's a really, to me, it's a little bit biased. It's not a fair comparison because you did not achieve your goal to keep the base 40 to 60 in the intervention group. There are several meta-analysis, cochlear analysis out there right now to see it will decrease your post of delirium. But there's a really no different in the post of cognitive dysfunction. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's another thing that uh, that's really becoming a significant issue for many people. Oh, yeah, right. for sure, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I mean, you know, what, uh, whether or not we're looking at post-op brain, you know, brain function, cognitive dysfunction, um, and, I mean, other benefits of using process EEG, I think, is getting, getting the depth right and making right. sure it's right for the level of patients that we're taking. Because I know I have plenty of colleagues that, don't use process EEG. I am actually a user myself. And I have been surprised so many times when you have, you know, an 80 year old little lady who is there and she actually is on a ton of medications and she is taking a ton of anesthetic and her vital signs are just fine. And then I have a a 50 year old guy who is strong and robust and it takes very little to keep them asleep. And I've been trying to fight a blood pressure because he's on ACE inhibitors and all these other medications and it's really tough. And so 
I think that we lose by just saying that we're only looking at this one thing for this particular monitoring. To me, at least that's my opinion. And also in an era where we're increasingly focused on the use of regional anesthesia sure. and co- common right long. Yeah. So you know, often don't need as much. Uh, right. And there's no, you know, no MAC number on the no. machine will, no. will account for that. Right. So regional anesthesia is potentially great for pain relief, but yeah, you know, the risk is we're overdoing it, and and without measuring it, it's kind of pretty hard to know, isn't it? Definitely, and you know, just like you know, that's what I was saying. Everybody is so different. Yeah, I had a patient. I was you know running gas. I run it point two mag. Mm-hmm. I would never do that if I don't have the oh yeah. EEG. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, that patient's gonna wake up. Yeah. And I had patient that I thought that patient's gonna need a lot, but not much at all. Mm-hmm. Worse, worse. You know, some of them. You're like, okay, this 80 year old, you know, point, you know, five mech will get that patient. That, oh, no, they won't. So, yeah. or I, Tiva right now. I mean, we do it a lot of Tiva and that. I mean, you have no idea. I no feel way. like that's in vital signs, a late indicator, you know, sometimes of, of where you are on that. Yeah. And I think, too, the consequences of anesthesia, whether it be the agents or the whole context, is, is a little scary. There was that observational study out of Taiwan, I think in the Lancet relatively recently, looking at the delayed downstream effects on cognitive function and uh, Alzheimer's or dementia, right? Mm-hmm. suggesting that uh, this was regional anesthesia versus uh, general anesthesia with a pretty strong signal, really? very big database. Right. You're not going to measure that for 10 or 15 years. right? So that was regional anesthesia versus general anesthesia, but it raises the issue of whether grades of general anesthesia actually might feed into that as well. So, you know, that was in the Lancet. I think it's it's kind of sobering uh, when it's not just maybe the cognitive function in cost, in subsequent days or weeks, but maybe in years right. downstream. Y- years to come. And uh, I certainly, I actually had a patient uh, a few weeks ago. That patient came to me and said, you know, I'm, I'm happy that you're doing anesthesia for me. <laughs> but last time I had anesthesia for a small procedure, I was now the same for six months. Yes. Had a yeah. significant cognitive decline after the anesthesia. And that patient was not that old, in the yeah. 50, 60 yeah. years old. So, you know, when we do anesthesia, we have several goals. One, make sure the patient is comfortable. Uh, two, make sure we do no harm. Mm-hmm. And I think this is something that really, to me, that's really important. And every time when, you know, while I walk into the room, when the patient's hypotensive, and many times once the, uh, the gas was on two men. Correct. The right. purple four was a yeah. 300. I said, maybe we should come, you know, come down those first. And uh, so it's really the, I think it's really the right dose for the right patient at the right time. And you have to have tools you do. To, to help you, you know, refine that and really right. be able to, to get, you know, to individualize care and not just as a as a population. I think it's just. I mean, we talked about neuromuscular blockade the other day. We yesterday, did. I think was. Yeah. In uh-huh. fact, if you're flying blind, you you really could be kind of anywhere. Right. And we have the technology, and the recommendations, and often leave it in the drawer. Right. And you know, I think EEG is a bit like that too, or a lot like that is as that well. Right? Let's. T- we're living in the twenty first century. Is that <laughs> yeah? So let's use it. You know, let's use the benefits of that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, e- exactly. And. Uh, you know, the other, there are several, several comments I hear from my colleagues. One is, uh, is uh, I can do this without. Mm-hmm. And uh, so my question to them is also, and uh, don't, you know, when we do cases, right, when we take care of patients, I think the first thing is you got to put your ego aside. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. It's really what good or harm can you do to the patient. And to me is if this is something that can help me to protect my patient from myself, I'm going to use it. From yourself. <laughs> and and uh, so I, I think that's uh, that's really, you know, uh, the first thing, the other thing that people would talk about is, uh, well, there's such old technology, it's such an old algorithm. So I actually studied that. So the, this algorithm was developed in 1998, and, uh, and they start using the same algorithm. And my counter argument on that is, this is actually the best studied monitor ever, the brain monitor. Yeah. So there are so many studies coming out to show this actually works pretty well. The saying is, if you ain't broke, don't fix it, right? <laughs> and then I did talk to, uh, you know, people uh, from Medtronic. They actually are working on to refund those to update the algorithm. Mm, so, okay. So, well, just, so that was going to be my next question, you know, kind of in closing. What do you think the future of process EEG and its place in, um, you know, in operating rooms and, and outside of operating rooms where we're doing other type of anesthesia. What do you think the future really holds for that? I, I, I So if, 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 if I really, you know, be ambitious about, you know, the whole thing is, even for what I think will be close, 
closed loop control anesthesia. Yeah. So meaning the anesthesia gas or the TIVA medication will be linked to the EEGs and the system will automatically control, you know, we're walking the base app. Yeah. And they are much better than what we do yeah. as a human. The closed loop system too, we've talked a lot about this on, or, or, or open loop, um, depending on how you look at it. Um, you know, instead of, and we all as clinicians know this, you give a medicine, the blood pressure shoots up or goes way down and you give bolus doses. Right. These are, or even with infusions, you know, you, it's, it's hard to kind of stick your finger on where you're going to actually land. This is taking all that information and doing micro dosing of all the medications, you know, whether it be anesthetic gas or vasopressors and keeping it all where it's just straight, you know, and, and, right. and a smooth line of how our, our patients do. So I think that's really exciting. I think right. uh, it'll be really interesting. I, we actually been working with a professor from uh, UC San Diego. Mm-hmm. So what he developed was pretty nice. So he used a closed loop to control the blood pressure, uh-huh. was able to maintain the blood pressure in a really narrow range. And I think the same thing can be used for process EEGs, maybe connect with the blood pressure. Yeah. Right? So you, you try to avoid hypotension, make sure you don't give too much anesthesia gas. And I think that most likely it will be able to help the patient. I think, the, to be honest with you, I think the technology is there. And I think the United States, we're always in lack regarding innovations. Uh, so actually the closed loop system has been on the market in Europe, but not in the United States. Mm-hmm. So we we need to catch up and, and um, you know. Yeah, and, uh, and one of the things that I always say kind of uh, final thought here is that, you know, I think you mentioned it before, Japong, is that, you know, we don't want to cause harm to our patient. The problem with anesthesia right now is, and we've said this before, you know, we drop off a patient, we're done, yeah. on to the next one, and you may never hear about those downstream effects. All firm effects. Unless it's your relative. Unless it is your relative. And or that, you. <laughs> and that's probably not the best way we should look at our quality control by accidentally buffing into a relative. It, you know, we, exactly. it would be nice if we had the systems to really look at that, uh, yeah. those lingering right. consequences. Yeah. yeah. But when you say you don't need it because your patients do great, you don't actually know what's happening to your patients you really don't. They, once they leave you. I mean, some people do have that luxury, but not all of us do. So. Not all of us. I mean, we're so busy doing uh, next cases. It is to me, is still... As an anesthesia provider, let's make sure we do not do harm first. Yeah, I absolutely. Think. I think it's a good note to, to note to end on. Shabong, thank you so much for taking the time out of what I know is a very busy meeting for you and for a lot of a fo- lot of folks out there. So cheers to you, all the great work you're doing. Hopefully we'll catch up soon to hear more, okay? That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks thank so, you much. so much. And thank That's you for listening you. to Top Med Talk. You know, you can find us at topmedtalk.com. We're on social media, your favorite platforms there. We also are on your favorite podcatcher. So whether it's Apple, Spotify, we're there. And if you're watching any of our YouTube videos, be sure to give us a shout out, a a thumbs up on that video. That always helps us out as well. Again, thank you so much to our sponsors. We couldn't do this without you. Cheers, everybody. Top Med Talk. Thank you. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe via your podcatcher. Don't forget to check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And also, don't forget, Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EdPom, evidence-based perioperative medicine we'd love you to find out more about that if you check out ebpom.org you can find low prices on some of the conferences we're organizing around the world many of them are virtual and don't even involve you leaving your own home check out ebpom.org now